What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear Rust? I bet it's systems programming and languages such as C++. Would you consider me crazy if I said that Rust is just as much influenced by functional programming and languages like Haskell? Have a look at this expression that calculates the factorial of a number in Rust. Just look at how concise. Oh wait, that's actually Haskell. Here's how it's done in Rust. Quite similar, right? With this sample out of the way, the rest of the video will cover how Rust and Haskell use similar philosophies for handling complexity. The approaches might differ a bit, but the underlying values are the same. We're also going to cover features that are present in both languages. Let's cover the common principles first. Haskell uses the idea of purity to ensure correctness. A pure function only takes an input and returns an output without any observable side effects such as creating state or performing I.O. operations. This allows for better abstraction and composability, as it's easier to understand what the function is doing. It will always do the same thing, no matter where you use it. With this, we can split up our program into separate pieces, or combine the pieces into bigger components, without worrying about the underlying implementation of the components. We can just treat every function at any level like a black box. In imperative code, where we create state and use it in the control flow of our functions, we can't reliably do this, since components that share state will be implicitly and almost invisibly linked together. In imperative code, functions can have side effects. Here we have the state of a program represented by this tree structure. This can contain flags, arrays with data, maps, and so on all tied hierarchically to the root context of the running program. This first function affects one part of the state while running its computation. If we try to compose this function with a second one that depends on a common part of the state, either by reading or writing to the same field or variable, we need to be aware of the implicit connection that gets formed. We also have to make sure that the functions don't interfere Updating the functions to get them to work together creates the implicit link, making it a lot harder to extract the functions for use in other places. Also, since relationships like this can form anywhere, it's easy to forget about them and cause regressions when working with the code. Of course, we can't just chill out in pure land, as we need to do stuff that affects the real world, so we need code that handles side effects, and for this Haskell uses monads. A monad is a computational construct which allows us to apply context-aware series of transformations to the data inside the context. Or, in other words, the context ensures that the transformation will not violate its own integrity rules. Now, monads do not automatically allow side effects, it's just that you can create ones that handle side effects for the programmer. We have our peer functions, which are separated from I.O. such as keyboard input or reading and writing to files. You can think of the main I.O. action as a mediator between these areas. Here's some code that reads input from the keyboard, transforms it to uppercase and writes it to a file. This is using the special do notation available to monads, which looks very much like imperative code. Behind the scenes, it's just functional calls, but this special notation makes it more readable. Each line is an I.O. action that the runtime will execute the side effects for, and then produce a value wrapped in the I.O. monad type. The main function is one huge I.O. action resulting from, let's say, gluing together all the smaller I.O. actions that it contains. The first call to the getLine function will have the runtime read from the keyboard. This will return the input string wrapped in the monadic I.O. type and bind it to the input identifier. Keep in mind, the value doesn't get stored in a variable, it just gets assigned as an argument in the main function call. The second line will bind the to upper function to the IO string, which will perform to upper inside the monad context, returning another IO string, or the uppercase string wrapped in the monad type. Then we bind write file to the monad result from before, which will execute the side effect of writing the string inside the monad to a file. This will also produce another monadic value, only this time it's just the empty unit type wrapped in I.O. Keep in mind, at no point do we have direct access to the pure values inside the monad, neither the original nor the uppercase one. 
we just tell the monad what behavior to perform, and the monad handles applying the function to the value in its context. Again, the produced result will be wrapped in the monad type. So, the main function is essentially just a long chain of monad transformations, and for the IO monad, the Haskell runtime will handle the necessary side effects for each transformation, thus maintaining the context through each step. The context in this case is that the IO side effects can fail, producing an error at any point. With this, we have a sort of encapsulation of impurity. We know that all the code that can cause side effects is in our monadic operations. Rust uses a similar concept with the unsafe keyword. In this case, the encapsulation of unsafe code happens towards the bottom level of the code hierarchy, unlike Haskell, where the top level logic of the program has to be in a monadic context. Instead of having a main encapsulated instance at the top, we have multiple blocks closer to the low level logic. In order to handle systems programming tasks, we have to perform operations which the compiler cannot guarantee safety for, such as direct memory manipulation. The places where we do this will be wrapped in unsafe blocks and accessed through a safe abstraction. In this way, we encapsulate the places where memory issues can occur. This will usually be done at a very low level. To the right, we have a code snippet that dereferences a raw pointer to a specific memory address. The compiler cannot guarantee that we can get a valid value from the address, so the operation needs to be in an unsafe block. Keep in mind, unsafe doesn't mean the code is unsafe, but just that the compiler cannot guarantee safety via static analysis, so it's up to the author of the code to check and ensure safety. Now, this still doesn't solve the problem of mutable state, which Haskell handles with pure functions. For this, we have mutability semantics together with the ownership system. You can mutate state in Rust, but this has to be done under strict rules. You can only mutate a value when nobody is reading it, let alone trying to write to it. Here, we have A owning the value of 5. B and C reference this value. We can't mutate the value using the A binding, or any other binding for that matter, while B and C are still valid. If we stop using B and C in the print statement, their lifetimes end before we try to modify the value using A, so the operation is loud. You also can change mutability for an entity unless ownership changes. Here we have the same binding A with the value 5 only that this time the binding is immutable. We won't be allowed to mutate the value in this case. But if we move the value to binding B declared as mutable, this will allow us to mutate the value 5 to 9 in this case. Keep in mind that it's not the value itself that is immutable, but the syntactic name through which we access it. This concept of moving values from one owner to another gives fine grain control over mutation ensuring that the values don't change when we don't expect them to, but still without being as rigid as pure functions. This also comes with a performance advantage. Pure functions mean we have to copy objects in order to return modified versions of them, while using the move concept in Rust allows us to modify the objects in place without needing a copy, which can be quite expensive for certain types. Of course, you can already do this in other languages, but with Rust, you can assign the object to a mutable handler when you need to modify it, and move it to an immutable identifier once you're finished with the changes, so you can maintain a greater level of control. To conclude this section, Haskell makes you handle state and side effects using monadic operations in a smaller encapsulated part of the program, while Rust uses ownership and mutability semantics to control state transformations throughout all the codebase. Another defining feature of the two languages that is easy to overlook is that they're designed around expressions. An expression is a piece of code that returns something. Statements, on the other hand, are parts of code that just do something but don't return anything. Most common languages are generally built around statements, and few instructions act as expressions. This makes the code less concise and the parts harder to chain together. As an example, in Rust, if-else blocks are expressions, so you can assign the result of a block to a variable, 
or even pass it directly to another expression. Matches are also expressions. Even loops are expressions. Here we return the number we break at after adding the value 32 to it. Most instructions in Rust are expressions, except for those instructions that declare variables and assign values. In Haskell, with all operations being function calls, virtually everything returns a value that can be passed to another function, so it's entirely based around expressions. Another area in which the languages are similar is their type systems. Both use complex type systems to encode business logic and then enforce it at compile time. Here are the similarities between the two. Type classes in Haskell are the equivalent of traits in Rust. With this, we can use values in a polymorphic way by defining behavior that the data needs to support. The show type class allows us to encode types as strings in order to display them. In Rust, this can be achieved by using the display trait. The type class slash trait system has a powerful integration with the standard library in both languages. For example, the read type class and from string trait allows us to construct data values from strings. These are kind of mirror traits to show and display which we covered earlier. Here we're reading the number 42 from a string using the read type class. And now we're using the from string trait for the same purpose. Both languages can derive traits or type classes. Here's the Haskell example. And now for Rust. Both languages support default implementations in traits slash type classes, though Haskell can be more flexible in this area. Here's an example with the EQ type class, where the user can either implement the equals or the not equals member function in order to have implementations for both. Because we define what functions need to do instead of how to do it, we can define a function in reference to another, so the user can implement either of these two and the other will be automatically available. Both languages support generic parameters and both allow defining type constraints on both data and interface implementations. Here we're using a generic type T with partial ORD as a constraint. In the Haskell example, we use a generic type A that has to implement the type class ORD. The associated type feature is also available in both languages. In the following example, we have a trait named contains with associated types A and B. If you want to learn more about how associated types work in Rust, check out this other video I made. And now, back to the Haskell example. Both languages have algebraic data types what we call enums in Rust. In Haskell, all data types can behave like enums by default. In this example, we have a command that can be used to perform one of three actions. And here's the Haskell equivalent. Now, don't confuse the Haskell enum with the Rust enum. An enum in Haskell is a type class which represents types for which I can get a successor and a predecessor. Here, I can get the next or previous day of the week using the successor and predecessor functions. Another area of interest is monads. While Rust doesn't have the ability to define the generic concept of a monad like Haskell does, it does have some specific instances of monads implemented in the standard library, while also allowing users to create similar constructs. Either is a monad that models something that can have one of two types, and this is often used to represent an operation that can fail with an error similar to the result enum in Rust. Here, the left variant represents an error message. In Rust, the second type in the result represents the error, which is modeled using an error type. But you can also use string messages here as well. The Haskell maybe represents a value that is possibly there or nothing, same as the option enum in Rust. Here, we have the previous examples where the function tries to do a safe divide just that we replace the errors with the nothing or none variants. Still, in the area of types, we have type aliases or synonyms. We can use the type keyword to create a shorthand alias in Rust or a synonym in Haskell for a certain type. In this example, we're assuming a default error type and aliasing to a result type that omits the error. Another common concept is that of pattern matching, 
which can be used to easily extract values by matching against the structure of some data. Here's an example straight from the Rust book, where we use pattern matching to extract inner data from the variants of the message enum. We can easily get the x and y coordinates from move, the string from the right tuple, and the RGB components from the change color variant. And here's the same thing in Haskell. This is using the special do notation available with the IO monad. The same kind of matching can be used in normal syntax with just pure functions. This is a function that returns true if the variant contains numeric values or false otherwise. The underscores indicate that we're ignoring the matched values. We just care about the specific variant here. We could replace the underscores with proper names if we want to actually use the values in our logic. These are just a few examples. While Rust can use pattern matching for match blocks, if and while lets, destructuring, tuples and slices, Haskell has much more powerful pattern matching. Due to Haskell's declarative way of defining functions, you can use pattern matching anywhere you could bind a variable. The possibilities would be too much to cover, but here's an example of a lambda expression that switches the values in a tuple between each other. Due to this feature, no intermediary values are necessary for the switch. Both languages provide compile-time metaprogramming with macros in Rust and the template Haskell extension. So, you can write code that at compile time generates other code. A potent example of this is the ability to check SQL against the database schema at compile time. The SQL X crate in Rust and the Postgres typed package in Haskell offer this feature. There are more similarities, such as the ability to apply functional operations on lists or iterators, along with functions and closures being first class citizens. Ideas such as lambdas but these are quite common in many languages, so they're not worth discussing here. Let me know what you think about the commonalities in the comments, and feel free to reach out to me with suggestions. Till next time!